All right. Hey, team. Welcome to Colby Yashi Maru, the show where devs all over the world boldly face off with the most logical tools on the web. I'm Colby Fayok, your Space Jelly Commander and your host of today's challenge. Today, we have Prince Wilson. Prince is a web app developer at Newzella. You can catch him on his stream on Twitch right over here and also on Twitter. And let's bring him in. All right. Hey, Prince, uh, do you want to give yourself a quick intro and anything you'd like to add there? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as you've already mentioned, I'm Prince Wilson. I work at a company called Newzilla. I Twitch stream every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard, so about th uh, three and a half hours from now, but on Tuesdays. And yeah, I think that's really it. Uh, I'm a person who likes to learn about a bunch of different tools. I love teaching people how to do tools, so I felt like this was a great opportunity. Absolutely. I'm excited too, because I haven't actually used Rust before, so it should be, it should be interesting. But uh, Prince, I hope you feel special. This is officially the 10th Colby Yashi Maru stream. Yay! Woo! Thanks to everybody so far who's been able to hang out and hang out with us. But uh, yeah, if you're new to Colby Yashi Maru, our guests will have one hour to complete their project challenge. Through that time, Prince will try to talk out loud as he's working through the challenge, and I'll also be asking questions along the way. So if you have a question, make sure to send it over through chat. So today, Prince will be facing off against building a Discord bot in Rust. If Prince doesn't finish the challenge, all is not lost. We'll see if we have enough time to finish it up, or we'll just chat about what the next steps would be. So Prince, before we get started, I'm going to bring in your screen. And do you want to talk a little bit about the tools that you're going to use, just to kind of give an idea before we dive in? Yeah. So like we said, uh, we already started, is we're going to use a language called Rust. It's very different from what we might be doing normally on Kobe Hashimaru. But uh, I would say, like, for the most part, I'm going to walk through everything that's going on. We're going to be using types. If you've never heard of a type, we're going to be talking about that. And then also, we're going to be using a service called Discord. Uh, I don't know if you have a Discord server, Colby. I do. I do. Perfect. It's a, so, it's a small but humble Discord server. <laughs> I, I'm here for it, but so we're going to be using a service called Discord, and we're going to be building a bot on top of that. One of the things is Rust is not the only language that Discord supports for making bots. If you are like more of a fan of writing it in JavaScript, totally down for that too. So, just something to know. Awesome, awesome. Well, so if you're ready to go, I think we can get started. Does that sound good? Yeah, it does. Cool. Let us do it. So, so normal. I'm going to oh, switch go the it. screen and I'm going to run the start command and let's hope that my webhook actually starts it. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to try all these new things. <laughs> and it didn't. Okay, let me refresh the page quick to see if... Uh... <laughs> it's totally fine. Still not doing it. Okay, let me give one more try. Wait, it is doing it. Oh, it is doing it? It is doing it. Oh my oh, lord. My, uh, we're we're oh. watching it live here, Colby. We're watching nice. it. Nice. Okay. Live well, you're here. on the clock now. <gasps> I guess my my one screen just wasn't updated. So we're good. Okay. <laughs> we love it. We're here for this. So, like I mentioned before, we're gonna be writing with Rust. Um, if you haven't used Rust, they have a bunch of kind of like what are the things to use it for, such as command line tools, WebAssembly networking, embedded. Uh, with installing Rust, we use a tool called RustUp, which basically does all the hard work of actually installing everything for us. I've already done this step, but if you're like learning or more interested in doing this, I highly recommend going through the Rust book later on. But to not waste any more time, I'm just going to dive right into everything. That sounds so, good. Let's do it. I already have a nice little folder for us. We're going to be using a tool called Cargo, similar to like uh, Node and NPM or Yarn. Cargo is our package manager inside of Rust. So whenever we want to start a new project, we'll just say like cargo new and the name of our project. We might call this like the test bot. I think that's like a fair name. And once <laughs> you've done that, you'll build your binary project. To not get too deep in it, there is like the difference between like a binary application and a library. Similar to like, you know, we have like React is a library, whereas bi binary you might actually execute and run something. Um, this is kind of the differences between those two. But now, when we look inside of our folder here, we'll have a new folder called TestBot. And so let's go ahead and open up TestBot. Boop, open another screen. Boop. Boop. One thing to note, oh, it should, mm, it should be fine. Um, one thing to note is I use a tool called Rust Analyzer. It's kind of like um, 
here's like how the types work inside of this language. It kind of gives me hints about when something's going wrong. It's kind of is nice. It, highly is it recommended. kind of like TypeScript? Like the hints that TypeScript has? I think similar because it's using the language server. So like TypeScript okay. kind of gives you kind of good insights because there's like an IntelliSense from uh, VS Code that basically says like, here, you're trying to do this thing and you can't actually do it. And that's like a new working project inside of Rust that's making it so much easier for folks. Interesting. Hello, hello. All right, so main project that we got going on here. We're gonna do some changes inside of here. The first thing to do, actually, let me get, even also like start from the beginning. We have Serenity. Serenity is the library we're going to be using. Specifically helps us to do all of the management with regards to like Discord and Rust. It has a, it has a bunch of examples also in here. We're gonna go through one of the examples, which is like the basic implementation of your Rust bot. And then we're gonna swap it over to what is known as the command framework just because it makes it a little bit easier. So to, in order to use Serenity, we're gonna need to install it. So we're gonna go into our handy dandy Cargo Toml. Com Cargo Toml is similar to like your package JSON, except that instead of it being JSON, it's Toml format. And so we'll have Serenity is equal to 0 0.10. Oh, interesting. Are there any specific like benefits to using the Toml format or is it really just personal preference? I think there's no, if you know. that's a great question. I actually don't have an answer to that. I, I'll be, I would be speaking like out of pocket being like, ah, <laughs> yeah, this is like definitely it. I think as long Fair as that. there's a structure, it doesn't matter which one you use. Um, some of the niceties is that you're more flexible with what you can do. So like sometimes mm -hmm. you might not be able to do certain structures that you could do in JSON yeah, or yeah. something you could do in Tomo, but you wouldn't be able to swap them. Makes sense. That's a good question. Something I'll think about because I have never actually okay. considered like, uh, huh, what would ha what would happen if you did this instead? Um, what we also need to do is, I think we might need some other features, but we're gonna test, we're gonna see what happens. So in order to get our little terminal going, we're just gonna do cargo build. Cargo build just like runs a project. It basically makes sure that we get all of our dependencies and make sure that it compiles. That's the difference between something like JavaScript and something like Rust is that there's actually a compilation stage. Ah, cool, so there was some error. Love when it starts off with the error. It normally doesn't have- That's a good sign. It doesn't have like a big chunky error like this. Uh, uh, usually this happens depending on the version I'm using. So maybe I'm gonna try one more thing, I noticed that the version inside of here and below is a 10, but right here, the latest is 10.4 and it's actually done 28 days later. <laughs> Definitely a, a gag to the game, uh, to the video game, uh, not the video game, what is it, uh, the, the movie. Um, hmm. I was wondering if that was a reference, yeah. <laughs> so I noticed it's still failing. I'm gonna try one more thing. So okay. one thing that's helpful, sometimes you, you know, you're installing something, you're like, okay, well, you have these examples, they should be working out of the box. So what I typically do is if I see any examples, most of them always will have like a cargo.toml and I actually use the cargo.toml to kind of give me insights of like, what are the things I might be missing? So like the difference is here is that in Serenity, they mention like the path as well as they don't install all of the things out of Serenity, they just install a few things. So this default feature says, don't install all of the things, instead install these things. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually take this part mm. of the code, I'm gonna swap that out. And that might be an exercise for other people if they were like interested into like doing some open source, you'd be like, hey, I think this might be wrong. Uh, yeah, easy, no, easy I, I love these little bits though, because it like it helps other people debug like the same kind of thing. So this is great. Exactly, so now we're gonna be doing the dependency building again. We're gonna see if that goes through. Ah, thank you. You ca caught my version already. <laughs> and so I'm gonna wait for this to do its thing. It might install, it might still continue to install a bunch of other stuff. If that doesn't work, I have one more thing. I literally just did this. So I was like, oh, you know, this should be fine. But <laughs> of course, of clearly course. when you try to put it on the clock, you're, you're not ready for it. There's something about that clock. If nothing else, I have, alternatives. All right, last test. So Tokyo is like a, a framework that we use specifically for like handling async stuff. All right. One is breaking. Let's see. Ring is typically like a 
process shouldn't do it. We put that timer on <laughs> and all of a sudden everything that everything wanted to work and then stopped working. That's so strange. <laughs> see. Hmm. Let me try one more thing. What could it be? I made sure that I have all the dependencies correct. Ring is a dependency that's being misdone. I have the right version. I have the, the correct defaults. Let's see. I'll try one other step. I wonder if Serenity version default features features this. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, nothing's popping out like obvious. Yeah, it's very strange. I haven't done any new updates to my language. I haven't done any new updates to the to my installations. I, in fact, made sure to run the installation, like made sure everything in a clean build would have worked. So now we are we are triaging. Ring is while you're thinking about. Oh yeah, okay. You saw the chat. Yeah. Yes. So Ring is a is like a tool you'll use for cryptography. And so maybe maybe what I'll do, cargo ring uh, last. Let's see if I can find that. Yeah. So like ring is typically used for uh, cryptography and you're using that typically in your libraries for anything that's de dealing with like requests. And so that's one of the dependencies in there. And that's what I'm, I'm thinking about is maybe let's just delete the lock and see like what happens. So maybe like it got out of sync and we it's not actually pulling the right dependencies. Yeah. If that's the case, reason. I guess uh, I was just going to say no language is prone to lock file issues. <laughs> exactly. Like nothing, nothing is, nothing is safe. Hmm. It says architecture 786. I wonder if I'm not targeting the right architecture. Do you have to be on like a certain Rust version or something? Hmm. The, I don't think I do. So I, in fact, uh, did this same Rust version before. Okay. And that's why I'm perplexed because I'm also haven't changed this. Like, hmm. One thing we could do is we could go into our, let's try another shell. Oh, we were right there. Cool. I don't think, yeah, I wouldn't think that would have fixed it, but that would have been very strange if for some reason, like two different terminals were, right. were not working. Oof, this is a big old error. Seriously. Build it. Linking with CC, error linking with CC. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so this, well, this is an issue back in 2015. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if I did something to my cargo, but I literally haven't done anything different. So the second link on the Google search, there's an answer in there. I don't know if that's worth looking at. Let's take um, the answer. There's one that has a bunch of emojis on it. Try bunch that. Of emojis. There so, we go. Yeah, that interesting. One. Have you have you read the last? Part? I don't know if that's related at all. So that's similar to what I was saying also before. Is that and this is what I was thinking is like for some reason, what I use to compile, so like Rust has a compilation stage and it can be compiled on different targets in different places. And for some reason, the thing that targets normally my Mac OS machine is no longer the default target. I think that's what's the that's issue so weird. here. Hmm, very strange, very, very, very strange. That has a bunch of things. I wonder if, I'm going to just, you normally build like this on Mac OS. You need to add the linker, the simplest solution. Yeah, I so said this would change like, so I was hoping we wouldn't have to do this at any point, but it's at least worth noting what's happening. So inside of Rust, you can tell like 
config. You can tell it like what is the actual configurations you want to have. So dot cargo slash config basically says like here you can set up these particular configurations to happen. So when we're targeting, ooh, so when we are targeting, and I just missed it. There we go. When we are targeting. Apple, basically that's what the architecture says in there, do these particular settings. That's what it should do. Let's... Fingers crossed. <laughs> that's looking great. It seems like it's... Yes, nice. <laughs> GitHub to the rescue. Shout out to GitHub issues, you know, like it's really coming through. I don't know why that happened. I cannot explain to you because I had literally done this before <laughs> we started. Where so I, even the other project I'm using right now uses the same exact setup i did it from a clean build and all of a sudden it just didn't want to work that's so weird and has this ever happened before have you noticed so funnily enough i was messing with my linker a while back but i this has not happened in any right, other right, rust right. project that i've done so that's why it was very peculiar but before uh, i have these like nano leaf lights and I put mm. basically a controller for a Raspberry Pi to allow me to do all my configurations. So like awesome. on my stream, when you like subscribe or you use your channel points, it actually changes the lights behind me. That's awesome. Yes. And showing me up on my stream, I don't have these lights that can change. <laughs> <laughs> well, tomorrow, hopefully uh, I will be working on Learn with Jason and we'll be doing some event sub with event sub, which is like a new API that they have. And maybe we'll do some light stuff directly. Oh, that's there. awesome. We'll see if it works. <laughs> One more thing that could just potentially go on fire. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Perfect. So notice like we did all of our compilation step. We did also like, it says finish the dev. So like whenever you build something inside of Rust, you'll have a new folder called target. And depending on what type of build that you did, whether it was like a, um, like a development or if it's a production, you'll have different folders inside of here. So in our case, all we did was we had a development one. So that's going to be our debug. And there's actually like this like test slash bot. This file is actually the executable file that we created, which is different from something that you would do inside of like um, in JavaScript. You wouldn't have like an mm -hmm. executable file. You have like your node.js that you invoke. This is actually the file we can take anywhere right now, at least on uh, Mac OS. And you can actually have that on any other operating system or I should say any other computer with Mac OS uh, and then you'll be able to run it. That's awesome. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Whew. That was scary for a second. We got past it though. Nice. Yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a step to just using Serenity. Um, there's a lot of little small things that it's doing. And so I'm going to walk through each step, step along the way that it does. So Did you hear that sound? I did hear that sound. So that means it's 45 minutes left. Oh, okay. Whew. Whew. Yeah. We got this. We got this. <laughs> this is the first time I had sound effects on this show, so hopefully it wasn't too <laughs> loud for everybody tuning in. It was a nice little doot doot I could, I could hear in the background. I grabbed it all from a Star Trek soundboard, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, so I was mentioning before, one of the tools that we're using for this is going to be Serenity, which is the actual library. Another one is Tokyo, which handles a lot of the async nature that we're trying to do. Rust, uh, when like Serenity first started up, didn't have all of its async tools kind of built in inside of the language. And so Tokyo was the thing that kind of helped people kind of figure out what is asynchronous kind of communications working like. Now that's kind of since changed, but we're still in this kind of like middle area where we got two things going on. In order to use, um, in order to use our Tokyo, we've already installed it, and we're going to use something called a macro. So macros are things like this particular one has like a, a pound sign in front of it, and we're just going to denote that the this main function is actually going to be where everything starts for our asynchronous bit. Now we can like call this main function as an asynchronous thing. The, the next few things I'm going to do are, I'm going to write this in like code, code, pseudocode. Is this what I was looking for? We're going to need our token, grab our Discord token, start up the Serenity client, and then we are going to need to just basically communicate that it's 
caught any errors or anything like that along the way. And those are kind of the primary steps. Nice. So what we'll do is we are going to grab our token, let token equal. And you'll notice this is something I mentioned before is like, you'll notice is like parenthesis. That's actually being written by Rust Analyzer. It goes and kind of tells me the type along the way of what am I using and how is it going to get it? So store token. That's awful. And if we don't have our token, we'll say something like, please add your Discord token to the environment. So that way I'm not committing my, my Discord token. I'm going to show my Discord <laughs> uh, token here. I don't mind that it's being shown. I can regenerate it. Um, nice, OK. It'll be fine. I don't, I don't foresee anything going wrong, but I want to make sure everyone sees the UI. Cause I think yeah. adding a, uh, you're creating your own discord bot is probably the hardest part. Not even the code part is the hard part, unfortunately, or it's, it's amazing. Maybe I should like how, say, yeah. I, I, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's amazing how some of the like dev portals just make it so difficult just to simply get a key. Yes. 100% agreed. We're going to do mute client here. So you'll notice I'm saying like let token is equal to this. Let is like our keyword, our signifier that we're going to be writing a variable inside of, by default, inside of Rust, things are not mutable. I cannot change the value along the way. I cannot like say uh, okay. token is now equal to this until so that's I- like a constant in JavaScript. Mm, yes. Like yes. <laughs> it's, it's, um, some people are very pedantic about like, this isn't, you can't qu equate it this way. And I, I want to say it is similar in the sense I cannot change it, but okay. there's also a const inside of Rust. And those are two different things. And that's why I want to gotcha. be careful saying yes. You'll notice here I'm writing like client colon colon build. So client capital C here is going to basically take, is like, you kind of think of it like an, uh, a class. I'm going to basically have like a class. I'm going to call a method inside of that class called builder. And it's going to take in that token. It's going to let me build something specifically our client. Uh, here we're going to pass in like how to handle any events that we receive. Events are like anything that's happening inside of our library, as well as anything that happens in Discord. So that can be anything from we're starting up the server, we're ready, something's gone wrong, or I've received a message and I don't know how to handle it. Those are sort of the things that you could think of it being used for. Await, and then we're gonna do expect. So let's say if nothing goes right, uh, we will say there was an error creating the client. I, would, I just caught that. So like the expect, that's interesting because it's almost like, uh, like a test assertion, right? Exactly. That's one of the beautiful things about like uh, Rust is the concept of like something can potentially be correct, something can succeed and it will be fine, but we need to be able to actually handle what are the error cases. And so by, by nature of Rust, we think about how do we handle the error cases organically while we're doing something. Um, you'll notice like here in this like var, end var, I'm doing something that potentially will succeed or something that will potentially error. And we have like a specific type in Rust that basically says like it succeeded or there was an error. And that's what the expect mm. helps us do is it says, if we have the error type, here's what you should display to the user. Interesting. Yeah. The await is going back to like the whole asynchronous. It, that definitely looks and feels a lot similar to what you're doing inside of JavaScript. We have like async await. Uh, you're in an async function. I'm doing some awaiting. Like those, those things still feel this very similar, which is why, you know, some people really like writing Rust after writing some JavaScript. <laughs> And let's see, let's try. So I have the client being pulled in, I have the handler being pulled in, but I need to actually include a bunch of stuff. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to import some stuff. So use is like how you can kind of think of import inside of Rust. We're gonna import from the standard library env, and that's how we will be able to use the env var. In addition, we're gonna say use serenity 
and let's say you want to import a bunch of things, but you want to like specifically name them off. You can do the same thing where you're using like curly braces to destructure that kind of works similarly in how to read. So we're going to use async trait, which I will explain in a bit. We're going to have some stuff for our model and models are like for serenity, like um, how to describe the data type that we're receiving inside of our Rust server. So we're going to have message and we're going to have gateway. Ooh. And then prelude is a bunch of beginning steps for us. So like, let's say we need to do a bunch of setup. Prelude is going to have all that for us. So that's all of our imports. If I like save this and I try to do like cargo run, it's oh, cargo run. It's going to break still. Everything's still breaking. We're still having a, a good time. I shouldn't yeah. need to install anything, but ideally what I'm expecting to see is one, it's gonna fail here first because I don't have my Discord token. And then it, even once I do have my Discord token, it's probably gonna fail again because of I haven't declared what the handler is yet. But I wanna kind of show what do errors look like. So it's not like Prince just like magically wrote all this code <laughs> and all of a sudden it just doesn't work. We got a comment here that Rust is the future. Rust is the future. I I, I want to I do want to take like a moment to say like there's a lot of nice things that Rust affords. Uh, I don't think everything has to be rewritten in Rust. I will also say that, which is probably a hot take somebody wasn't ready for. Um, but I really do appreciate what it affords us. I'm gonna get rid of this for a second. Man, so things that I wasn't expecting to fill. So I expected to see the handler. We didn't get to use all these, which is I, what I expected. Build is something I wasn't expecting to fail yet. So that caught me off guard, but for the most part, we're looking pretty good. Nice. Um, let, uh, oh, I know what it is. I think I spelled this incorrectly. I think it's builder, perfect. So you'll notice like, once again, I have a bunch of types afterwards. Once again, this is like, in VS Code, there is a tool you can have as an extension called Rust Analyzer, uh, spelled like Rust Analyzer. And this kind of gives you the types that you're working with in real time. So as I'm like updating stuff, it's actually going to tell me what are the types That's super along helpful. the way. Yes. So in most of what you're doing inside of Rust, you're going to be uh, maybe declaring the types ahead of time, but it's good to see like, what are the types over the course of me changing stuff? So you'll see here, like the client builder, I'm doing a method on the client builder and I keep doing that. And it actually turns into a result, which is what we talked about before, where it can either turn into a client or it can turn into an error. And seeing that in front of you, as opposed to like having it all in your head where you're doing that in JavaScript, this right. is kind of one of those things that's like really helpful to have. I'm gonna move some stuff around in my other view here. Perfect. So that way I can keep track with all y'all. Um, so we have our builder, we have this, we did that. Now we're gonna add that handy dandy handler that I mentioned before. And so the handler is all is all gonna handle the messages that are being sent. In specifics, what we're gonna do is we're gonna implement the event handler for handler. And handler is gonna be a struct. Structs are like, mm, trying to think of like what the best name of those things gonna be called. Structs are like declaring your own types. So let's say you wanna have your own custom type. Struct is kind of how you would do that. And maybe you want specific operations to happen for that handler or that uh, that type. What then you'll do is you'll implement specific features for that object. In this case, we're saying this particular event handler needs to be able to have this particular thing available to it. And this is how you can say it's available. I'm, I'm trying not to overload with jargon because I think it can be <laughs> like more confusing than it actually is. So if there are people out there are gonna be like, how, like, that's not how I describe it. I'll be like, yeah. it's okay. You and I were trying to build this project and I'm making sure we're all along the ride. 
Well, I think I'm a good audience member since I haven't ever used uh, Rust before. So I'm, I'm bearing with you so far. Perfect. So what we're going to do is we're going to implement two methods for our handler. One is going to be message, and then the other is going to be ready. So ready kind of like indicates like, okay, here we have received the event ready. We me meaning that it's time to run. We're connected to Discord. We can do the thing. The other one message is going to be whenever we receive or hear a message that goes on inside of Discord, this is what we're going to do, or this is what we're going to hear. And so that's kind of like why you would want to do that. Um, I don't actually know if Discord JS has a similar kind of hooks inside of it, but that's kind of what I'm thinking about. So we'll do async async function. This is the first function that we've written, kind of really. Uh, we're going to write ready, and you can actually see here ready ready pops up. And so if I oh, nice. press enter, it actually will autocomplete for all the things. And that's one feature that is part of Rust Analyzer. You can kind of okay. know how to autocomplete some of the stuff for you. Uh, we have a question. Is the, uh, are you going to have the source code? Is the source code available we can throw up later? Absolutely. I definitely will have that available for you. Um, awesome. In addition, like if you're interested, you could also go through Serenity RS. Uh, oh, and then inside of Serenity, they have a bunch of examples as well where they kind of talk through some of this stuff. Um, and so if you're like, I want to see more things I can do with Serenity, uh, they'll also have that. So don't feel like you have to only use what I have shown you here too. <laughs> so what I only gonna... trust you. Oh, thank you. So <laughs> sweet. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have our thing here. I think what we can do do oh i appreciate that your chat is so nice <laughs> i love them they just make they just like warm my heart i definitely agree though you're doing a great job so you'll notice here like print ln print new line um i actually don't know why it's oh i guess print line right that's what it says and the exclamation mark that's actually very key inside of um uh, inside of rust i almost said javascript but inside of Rust, this is another type of kind of like function, another macro where it does some work for us. It makes it easier. It's called a functional macro or yeah. I might be wrong with that. It might be called a procedural macro, whatever, semantics again. But this specifically, what it does is says like here, if you write this with the exclamation mark, we're going to do a bunch of work for you when we are ready to execute. Don't worry about it. Just do these two parts here. And then it just works similar to just like a message. So I can say this person is connected. And so I'll say, um, let's change this to like ready. Ready.user.name. Oh, I hear it. There we go. 30 minutes re rating. 30 minutes. We're doing great. I, I'm already feeling comfortable. We, we had some of the issues with that starting off, but I'm already, I'm getting close. We're moving good. Inside of Rust, we have to do a bunch of not fun stuff like adding semicolons, which is not fun. Uh, but you gotta do. You don't it. like semis? Not, not, no, not really. Not really. I'm a, I'm I'm not a semi a, guy. It's all right. <laughs> I think once <laughs> I moved to, I moved away from my first language or my second language, I guess, is Java, and. That was all semicolon oh, okay. and C, which was my first language, it also had semicolons. And so I've just accepted the fact that anytime I'm doing any like low level programming, there's always going to be semicolons. Mm -hmm. um, it's I didn't fine. realize you knew all those languages. I can't write any Java for you anymore. <laughs> I can still write C gotcha. very fine, uh, but don't ask me to ever write you some <laughs> Java code. That's never happening. You'll notice uh, before I had some red, again, this is from Rust Analyzer. It tells me when something's broken. Um, it's basically saying like, cool, you're trying to do this function async and I can't actually do that. I can't, I can't use the async function. How do I do that? You have to tell me. And so that's one of the features out of Serenity is this adding this async trait macro. And it's gonna be like, cool, like here's how to handle asynchronous stuff. And so now you can see all that red is gone. Nice. Okay. So, I was wondering. Go ahead. And I was just wondering with the, the big red lines. <laughs> yes. 
uh, Rusty and I is very good about telling you like, hey, you're doing something that you might not want to be able to do. Um, yeah. For instance, like here, it's giving me like a yellow line. It's gonna say like, oh, you're giving, you're doing something, but it's not actually used. Are you sure you want to do this? Whereas the red line's like, you're gonna break if you try to do this. <laughs> and most of the time, when I like run cargo run, it's gonna tell me those same errors. But it's kind of nice to be able to have those before I even ran any of my code. Yeah. And you'll see here, I try to run our code right now, and it's actually saying that errors, please add your Discord token to the environment, not present. So it's very hey, good at about catching those things ahead of time. Yes. So let's, let's take a step and pause here from writing code. This code part, we haven't finished everything, but I want to take a second because I think that the next part, the actual add the Discord bot to your server is complicated, and I want to explain that part. Okay. <laughs> Shouldn't be, but it is. So Discord has its own developer portal. In your developer portal, um, you'll be able to add applications. You'll see I already added an application called Ko Kobayashi Bot. Um, very, very absolutely named. If you would like to name your own bot it. something else, you can do that. But I'm just going to show building an application real quick. Uh, let's think of another bot we got going on here. I don't know. I usually use my my catchphrase of like when I don't know how something works or, or like when I just want to name something silly, I'll use the word beef. Um, that's my go-to word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, partially because it's just easier. It's like, it makes it seem silly. So no one's like, oh my gosh, it needs to be named this way. Uh, but yeah. So that's making the application. The next step then is to actually go into the OAuth 2. Um, and inside of here, we're going to add a scope. And that specific scope we're going to add is the bot scope. And so what this is going to say is like, this particular application can make a bot. In Discord, you can do a bunch of different things. It can do anything from handling email to doing guilds. If you want to do anything fancy like that, you can do stuff like in there. But specifically, all we're going to do is do bot stuff. You'll have to read through the Discord API to basically understand what all these other scopes are. But I couldn't figure it out. And so I want to make sure everyone <laughs> else can figure it out. I feel uh, like there's so many features to Discord that I still don't even, like, I don't even know what a guild is. Like, is that? So that's what Discord's servers are. They are guilds, um, okay. which, but like, like the mind blowingness right. of like, wait, that's what they're called? <laughs> right. I just feel like. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, but <laughs> I had no idea. I wouldn't have known till I've, I've struggled through this <laughs> enough. <laughs> Um, so here we have like the scope bot. When I don't have this clicked in, you'll actually notice that there's like no other things here. So if I say like identity, I can do something like that. But like when I do bot, there's actually extra permissions I can have. So if I wanna have like the ability for this bot to be an administrator or maybe it can view some audit logs, any of the things that a user can do, I have to actually manually say like which one of these particular permissions would I allow you to have. Typically, you may not want to give them administrative permissions. This means, because let's say somebody uses your bot, you do something malicious, um, they have direct access to everything of the server, um, including deleting the server, which yeah. you may not want them to have access to. So you might want to like limit the amount of permissions that they have, such as like managing the server and doing other things. And so I know there's a there's a saying about that, like the the least the least I don't know. Yes. Like, you know what I'm trying to say. I think the the idea is always like the least amount of privilege given to yeah. like a resource uh, partially for this mistake. Uh, if you've ever used something like AWS, this is like why people always recommend like don't use your administrative account. Yeah. Because you'll create an account with AWS and it's like has direct access to do literally everything. But if you use that account to do all your operations, if for whatever reason somebody has access to that account, they'll break everything. Bad and news. we don't want we don't want that. We don't we don't need that. So our bot won't have all these permissions. Um, so you might choose like manage server, maybe manage roles, manage channels, maybe not even kick members or ban members, depending on what you want it to be able to do. You could probably do manage emojis few channels, maybe send messages at least. Your bot might want to respond to people, um, maybe manage things. You can do whatever you'd like. Um, this The choice is yours, as they said. And at the end, your 
you're going to have a URL here and it's actually going to be like here, authorize this particular client with these permissions. Discord uses like a number system in order to be able to say what permissions you have access to. And this is like how they be, are mm. able to say like, this is how, what your set of permissions are. I take this link and I just throw that in to the browser. And this, oh, doesn't have a bot. I haven't created it probably. Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. Authorize access, OAuth application does not have a bot. Maybe, oh, maybe I see, goes back to the whole prince and <laughs> yeah. do a step. Um, I think what I'm missing here is even though I've done this, like application has these settings, I also need to add a bot. So I'm going to add a bot. A bot is not just an application. Uh, it could be a part of an application. So our bot is going to have the same name as our application, fortunately. But let's try this one more time. Perfect. That's what I wanted it to do. It's, it's doing it. But this is a way for you to be able to like determine like how do you want your uh, application to be able to have like uh, whatever image, if you want to have like a special image for your bot, maybe you want the, the space jelly to be the image icon. You could do all that here. You can even rename it if you'd like. We can we can call it uh, ooh uh, space jelly when we come to it later. We're gonna save that. I'm gonna refresh it just to see what it does. So it's still gonna say beef bot. Bot's gonna connect. And we can actually select the server that we'd like to connect it to. So I'm nice. gonna connect it to a server that I started. Um, and we're gonna just do that. We're gonna see, and you can check once again before you finish the, you know, like saying this bot is added to your server, you can actually check and uncheck like what permissions they have access to. So with the OAuth, you're giving that rule the ability to to select into those but when you give that bot access you still need to include those as part of that access exactly and it's going to assume that you want to do these things by default anyway um but for instance like if you decide like typically from like a i'm a discord admin maybe i don't want them to have these per particular permissions when i give it when i'm accessing someone else's bot but if mm. me the user who's creating this bot might not care. So it's yeah. you have like that kind of granularity of control. And you can see, boop. And then we say, I am a human. And then it's been authorized. And I go over to my Discord server, which is on the other screen that I have over here. But boom, we can see Yay. Space Jelly has landed. We have it. Now, a bot exists as a user. The next thing is to then make sure the bot actually is running. So right now we've added the bot into the server. So there's always like add bot, then bot has to run. Um, when we created our bot, we needed to be able to have that Discord token. Remember how it says like, I don't see your Discord token. This is the Discord token. So in the bot section, you're gonna have this token inside of here and we wanna want that token. We're gonna stick that into our environment variables. Typically, when I do this, I use like a like a an EMV file. Mm. But for like for ease of use, I'm going to just run it as an additional thing to my run command. So I'm gonna say um, Discord underscore token is equal to all of this, then cargo run. So every time I'm running right now, I'm gonna to have to have that extra line in front of it. Oh, beautiful. Well, it ran. This time it didn't fail, uh, but I didn't do anything after that. So you'll see here, it ran the application. It actually finished the application, but it's not doing anything afterward with it. And that's no is... longer yelling about the environment variable. Exactly. And so what I think I need now is one last thing, which is to start the client. That's what I forgot to do. So I'm gonna walk through the steps one more time to make sure I got it here. We got our Discord tokens taken here. We started our client. We made sure like our client has all of these things being built. And the last thing that we wanna make sure to do is not just uh, catch errors along the way, but specifically catch errors along the way when we've started the client. So we'll say if, let's, this is going to be some weird, like, uh, 
I don't know what you'd say, call on it, uh, weird um, syntax in terms of like what you've seen in JavaScript, uh, but I'll yeah. write it all out and then we can go through what it does. I like the keyword of why. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's going to be good. Client error. And this is specifically from like, I always do this. I see this in the examples quite a bit. It's just very sim simplistic, like why. Um, so uh, Nikki actually says, if let is kind of like a, a fancy if statement. So let's say on this part here, you'll see client.start. That means like the client will do its thing. It's going to make sure it's working. And then it's going to like await anything else. Okay. Let's say something goes wrong, right? Like we want this part to happen, but let's say something goes wrong. If something goes wrong, we're actually going to do an assignment. We're going to create a variable. If something goes wrong, it's going to match against this particular thing. It's going to say like, if we went wrong, here is the error state that's going to look like. So it's kind of like a, it's like an if case, only if something happens. Otherwise, it's just going to run its thing. It's going to keep going. But if something goes wrong, we're going to say store the value of the error inside of this variable called y, and then print out the error. If nothing goes wrong, it's not going to even worry about all of this inside. And now, when we try this car to run, what I expected to see before was that it just continues to uh, invoke it just keeps running but one thing i noticed is it wasn't running afterwards so like it just stopped at this part and so now we should see this exactly this where it Success. says space jelly is now connected this is what i was expecting to see before it's it actually saying like here we're now running perfect now this is all great like this now says we're connected to Discord, we're doing good, but we haven't actually done the actual bot here write stuff things. So I'm gonna make like a simple like message thing and then we're gonna go from there. I mentioned it before, we're gonna write a function called message. So anytime I see the message event, here's what I need to be doing. And in our case, what we're gonna do is, I don't know, like we'll make it something simple. like. Let's say we receive like a specific message and let's say if a message.content is equal to this particular thing, I always like to do this. This is the example that they use, um, ping. So like if I see the command ping, then we're going to respond with pong. Similar. Example. I love it. It's, an, it's really simplistic, <laughs> but it does show a lot of steps inside of it, which I didn't appreciate right. beforehand. Um, You'll see that if let again. So let's say I do an action and I want to keep track of the error. This is what I'm going to be able to do. And I'm going to say, oh, I forgot. Uh, if I say like message, so that's referring to our variable message up here. If I see this message, then go to the channel. Oh, 15 minutes. We'll get there. I got you. I got you. We'll use the say command. And so the say command says, Inside of the specific channel that you did this ping, go and repeat or send some text along the way. So in our case, this HTTP is like telling Serenity, like here's the client to be using. Here's how you send your request. And what our request is going to be is going to actually be inside of this CTX, which is short for context. It's going to be context dot HTTP. So like a lot of little Rust things. So just to kind of go over this is what I'm saying here is go to the object context that I'm giving you, pull out the particular client that I am using, this HTTP, and this, this specific thing here, this ampersand, very important. Oh, made it too big. Made it too big because importance. Enhance this ampersand is saying like, don't consume this value, only give it a reference of this value. That's like a critical huh. part inside of Rust comparatively to other languages. Um, this basically says like, Rust is paying attention to how memory is being used. And we wanna make sure that we're not consuming memory before, it's, uh, before it is unavailable again. 
So this ampersand is basically saying like, here, make sure that this value is available for later. I'm not actually taking this value and saying like, free it up when it's done. That, that is a big like concept yeah. inside of REST. It's, it's specifically about like uh, the difference between the mutability and can I take the value with me later on? Yeah. So it seems like it requires a little bit more granularity with memory management. Yes, perfect. That's yeah. exactly exactly the way to phrase it. it is in Rust. But Rust, Rust generally is like that. You're yes. Saying, right? yeah. mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what makes Rust very unique in co compared to other languages that also let you do memory management. Is that you are you have much more control over how long some value has to last. Um, specifically, it tries to free up as soon as it can. And what we're doing is we're basically saying like, we're not consuming this value. So when it ever falls out of scope, you can just free it. We're just saying, give me a reference to this value. So that way I can have it for later on. That's like the synopsis of this, this whole thing. I could go into a long rant into that, but we only have 12 <laughs> minutes. Um, for another day. Exactly. So we're going to do our Pong message here. And let's say again, if something goes wrong, let's just print out a message like it says error, sending the message. And I'm going to do some special syntax here. This says like debugging syntax. Give me the reason why. Cool. So we have here an issue. Why? Existential question. Why is it causing an issue? Is that also a REST thing or is it just what, like the example calls the error variable? The error variable, just the example is calls it Y. Okay. Yeah, I, I can call this once again, see, you can call it beef. And, but for somebody <laughs> reading it, they'd be like, ah, I don't know what that means. Right. Um, but that's, that's why I go for it. Um, let's see. If I have the let error is equal to this, we do this, ah, I know why. Because even though I am saying say, I wanna have the await here, I believe, yep. And so message.say, the say method results in a result and we wanna make sure we're just waiting for that result to come back. Chats better be careful here, I'm gonna start singing. What will you sing? Oh, there's a tell me why. Oh, I tell just did start singing. Why? I need to do a new one, Kobayashi Karaoke. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so now our space shell is connected. And then when I go to my Discord, if I talk into the thing, let's say I say ping, we still see Pong. We're out here. We have our message. We can do it again. Yay. We can say ping, Pong. Beautiful. Amazing. It's letting us happen, it is doing it. So let's say like, you know, you have this message, it's going well, it's happening, we have 10 minutes. I think I still have enough time to do the command framework. Um, one of the things I was thinking about when I was doing this, whew, spicy sounds. I was like, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if you were able to tell, but it was like, so the 10 minutes and surprise for the five minute, like I tried to use different, like not just the alert. It's like, you know, and they're called, what are they called? Like in shows where it's like, dun, dun, dun. Yeah. like the sound effects that are more like a trumpet and it's just making it very dramatic. Ah, uh, yes, yes. We're like at the triumph. We're at the I climax. Think it's called a sting. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. That is what it's called. Um, so we have our message. We have the, all of this. I am going to convert all of this. What I'll do before I do that is I'll commit it as it is. Clear status. Get oh, get status. Get add. Get commit. Uh, finish ping command before command framework. Boop, boop. Clear. Perfect. 10 minutes thinking. What are you gonna do with those 10 minutes? I think what we're going to do is we're gonna swap them. We could do one of two things. We could easily make another command that directly just works with whatever we have it saying, or we can do it with command framework. The command framework does have some more setup stuff inside of it. 
Um, specifically, what we will need to do is make sure that I have added some more uh, things. I think I'm just going to go for it. We're just going to do it. Uh, command framework, it requires handy dandy framework features. By default, we didn't have this installed, but we're going to make it happen. In addition, we're going to do our standard framework here. So like one, we're going to use the, the framework method, and then also we're going to use the standard framework. There's some other frameworks if you're interested, um, but those are the ones that we're going to be using. Now, when I go and build it, it should still all succeed. We can keep both kind of things available for us, but the command framework takes advantage of macros. So it makes it easier for you to write code. So you don't have to be out here writing a bunch of if cases. Like you'll notice, like I wrote like if the doc content equal equals ping, then it does a thing, but that's not like really scalable, right? Like I can't write if this every time, if I have like 10 mm -hmm. commands, that'll be a little bit more difficult. So the command framework makes it so it's easier to say like, this is the particular command that I like to be able to run. Um, when you're like thinking of like building out a big old bot, you might do something like this where you're like, how do I structure everything together? Um, right. And that's kind of where it comes from. Boop, boop. So we might do something I'm thinking I'm thinking if I can just do like the handy dandy, like, okay, I'm trying to think, thinking aloud, thinking fast. <laughs> I'm getting kind of nervous. Um, basically, what we want to do is have a group of commands together. We'll add that into another struct. We'll call that general. We'll have a group macro that references the general group. And we'll say like the commands that are in the group and we'll call this one ping. Inside of here, I need a function called ping. I need a command because basically you'll have two steps. You'll have the method that you are connecting to for your command. And then you'll also have like whatever data that you're passing along. So let's just say uh, CTX, uh, I think it's just context here. And then I don't think I need anything else. Maybe the message itself. So I can reference the message. Doo -doo -doo. Oh no, args, I'm, a, I'm making mistakes. For a second, th I thought that was a new Rust character. <laughs> I'm just throwing, I'm throwing all the new new <laughs> things in here. Command result, beautiful. And then I basically can just do all of what I was doing here before, but now actually in the thing. So I'm gonna just, boop. Is that the five minute? There was, we go. Yep, that's that the five minute. <gasps> <gasps> I love it. This is. So exciting. I'm here for it. I, for some reason that in my brain, it brought back up the, um, I'm just watched or I just started, uh, the King Kong or Godzilla versus King oh, Kong movie. No spoilers. I got to watch that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I will, I will, we're, we're done with that conversation. It's not even happening. I'm excited to watch it though. Um, Let's see, what else do I need? I need, I have the context. I need the message. No, I need the args. I need, I need args. Do I really need args though? Typically I need this like arguments thing, but it'll be fine. I think it's all right. So I'm thinking about like, what are the things I need to import? So inside of the framework uh, package, inside of standard, I'm gonna to need to install a few things. I'm gonna say args command, command, uh, is it options? Command options, command group, and what else do I need? Uh, oh, I need all these, I did that. I have all these options. I also need the macros for those, which is command and group. Up my comma. So we've imported all the things. 
you should be fine. Why are you, why are you whining? Mm, group should be fine. Oh, what are you whining about? We're just gonna, we're gonna run it. Oh no. Let's go for it. Beautiful. Oh, I know. In addition to all of those things, so I have my group, I have my function. I need them all to be async. That gives me the command result. I'm gonna say, okay, here, because command result is just a fancy smancy, like, okay message. I don't have command result as a thing. Result. Now I have command results. Is that not in the import? No, that is in the import. What am I thinking? I think that's fine. Maybe comma, that's what I was missing there. Um, so now I have the command framework. I need to add a few things inside of the client, which are the different ways of connecting the commands. Whew. We're not gonna make it. I'm already nervous. I'm already nervous. Ah! How close are we? Are we close? We're like pretty close. I, I, okay. I have a feeling that I will not, I will not pass the, uh, <laughs> the, the actual thing, but. Kurt's here and he believes in you. Oh, <laughs> y'all are, y'all are too kind to me. Oh, and I dropped something. Um, what no I'm time. Thinking? Leave it behind. Uh, oh, um, what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Framework. Okay. Um, framework. I need the framework, but then I need to figure out where to declare framework. I think that was let's framework here. Standard. Nope, that's not the one. Oh no, that's too many things. Standard framework new. Beautiful, love that. Um, and then we're gonna configure. We have our like configuration object. I might call that like config obj. Bad names, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll do the framework. I'm trying to think. Um, oh no. I think I messed up. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Mm -hmm. Salvageable. It is salvageable. It's like it's like the small details. This is like the details of like how the framework works. So like right now we have the framework. We're setting it up. We're configuring the object. We have the configurations themselves. We might do things like like what are the prefixes? So like you'd have like prefix inside of here being like this. And we need to do that. Oh, didn't get it. I can hear you. It's. Yeah, that was tense. So maybe I need to change. So I have it so it goes for 10 seconds. It just does the final thing. But if you hear it, that's good music, right? We made it work once, but I love that. <laughs> exactly, I love the music. Exactly, yeah. But, you, oh, I have the cargo run fail. Let's see if I can make it run. Let's see if it even does work. It may It may work. It may surprise us. Maybe, maybe we'll be good. I'm going to call it a win if it does. <laughs> Drats. Oh. Didn't didn't get it. <laughs> Messed up it trying to do just the tiny too much. I I know what you I got need the to add. you got the original bot though. I I would call that a win. We're we were going for the bonus points. I was going exactly, for the whole exactly. whole one hundred percent here. Exactly. Do you uh? How long do you think? Do you want to try to do that, or do you want to just call it? I think we're all right. I think okay. what I can do is I can I can make that its own commit, which is fortunate. Like you doing doing it in Git makes it nice to be able to see like yeah. here's the differences between the two. Um, I think what I need to do is just like add the commands. So like right now the the framework basically saying like here is the framework we're using, and I just need to add the commands group to it. I think it's just like group, and then that yeah. would be it. But it's fine. Linking them together. That's awesome. Well, this was this has been an awesome walkthrough. Like it's I feel like this is a great example for getting familiar with Rust because like the different pieces for like between like connecting to Discord itself and like all that stuff and that's yeah, it's been great. I am a big fan of like finding projects that end up being easier to learn. Um 
I I uh, am a big fan of the Rust programming language book. Rust programming language book. Um, I do I do in the long form recommend this particular book if you're a, a big reader, um, partially because it goes through from beginning to end of the language. You can once you install Rust. In fact, I believe by default it's actually able and available to have it offline so you can actually have it directly there i think it's just like cargo awesome. docs book that's intense uh, is i've never seen a language ship with a book before that's pretty great but yeah uh did you want to just like really quickly walk through what you did uh what you did today yes so what we started with was we used rust to build a discord bot before when we did this i had used the kind of like implementation way of saying like the handler handles all of our messages from like ready to message. And then we try to convert it over to what is known as the framework method or the command framework where we use macros to do that. All that so we can power a bot that can say ping and pong. We also um, came across a small technical detail Oh no, Colby! <laughs> can you hear me? We can hear you now. That We're... is hilarious. <laughs> was it just me, or was it? I was still here. Zoom? Oh okay. no, I was still here. I I was confused. I was like, wait, did did I? Did because you were <laughs> you were closed on my screen, so I was like, oh no. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, we're back. I don't know if it's still actually recording because I still see the, oh, I just need to switch to Zoom. Oh, it didn't rejoin. Wait, are we not live? Or can, does that mean that they can't hear us? Or can they hear us? Oh, we're still live. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand how that crashed like that. Oh, oh my heart. I'm going to stop sharing. How's that? Yeah, um, <laughs> and I, I can't even seem to, oh wait, it's because it's on the second screen. So I'll at least get us I back. Love... Oh, can you actually share your screen? Because now it's like inside of the- Oh yeah, for sure. I, I just it. don't have it set up to, I have no, a very you're, specific You're setup. totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, just to get the nice little intro or outro rather, um, <laughs> thank you for everybody who rated. That was amazing and the worst possible timing ever but i do sincerely appreciate it but um prince thank you so much for coming on today this has been an awesome walkthrough rust is really cool and i appreciate you walking through an awesome demo of it um but yeah everybody make sure to check out prince's twitter his stream uh at max cell and next week we're gonna have melissa mcgregor who will be facing off against building a full stack jam stack app with redwood js so prince before we go any last words my last words is be ready for anything you truly truly cannot predict what's going to happen but <laughs> yeah. we're here for it all yep yep well i think that's definitely fair and did i no, it's still here. Okay. Well, uh, this is uh, Colby signing off. And uh, thanks, everybody, for stopping by. Bye, y'all. <laughs>